from Slate. Gippy Goat Farms is one of those wondrous little places where you can pet your own food. It's a goat farm and petting zoo. You can sample goat milk, goat cheese, and, well, goat. All the while you're feeding and snuggling with the kids, that'll be tomorrow's dinner. John Gomans runs it. Yes, the goat dairy, we milked about 2,000 goats there twice a day. And then something happened last year, the day after Christmas, Boxing Day. That's Richard Rowland. He'll be reporting half the story today. Uh, at about 6.30, a mob of vegans showed up and very quickly stole three animals from the petting zoo. And then they went up to the dairy and stole one animal out of the yard that had a bit of a sore foot. And then the police arrived. The police requested that they leave, but they refused to do so. Chris Delforce is an animal activist and filmmaker and founder of a group that's responsible for the targeting of Goman's farm. Gippy Goat is a business that is bludgeoning 10,000 baby goats on the head every year. That's just what they do. They separate the, the babies and they kill all the males because the males will never be able to produce milk, just like the cow dairy industry. The events at Gippy Goat were part of a series of increasingly disruptive actions by animal activists in Melbourne over the last year. The situation became even more intense with the public release of a map that Delforce's organisation crowdsourced from the animal rights community. It's an interactive map based on Google Maps covering factory farms, slaughterhouses and other animal exploitation facilities across Australia. There's over 5,000 facilities located on that map. It isn't just a map of factory farms. David Killoran, who will also be reporting this week. Each little location has an icon of an animal, a pig, a cow, or a goat, and there are descriptions of slaughtering practices, even photos and videos taken undercover, and there are addresses and, in some cases, names of the farm owners. It's just this whole new culture that we're trying to push towards where everyone knows where these places are and and what they're doing and they're no longer able to operate in secrecy. The reality is it's also a map of people's houses, people's places of work. David Jahinki is the president of the Victorian Farmers Federation and a farmer himself. And what was the map intended to actually produce? It's the incitement of collecting information without the permission of farmers. And for the mere fact that it is on farms and not a map of either race or religion or creed, that is another whole discussion of where is society going, what are we accepting uh, as a community. Farmers say the map has been the source of a lot of stress, fear, and heartache. And last night I was at a meeting in particular who I met um, a farmer there who was on the map and it absolutely cut him to the core because he felt like he was tried and prosecuted without any chance for him to tell his story. All the good things that they actually do to have the best health and safety records and that the amount of compliance and regulation that we actually adhere to None of that gets told in this story. If you're putting private information out and inciting for the general public to gather information or in some regards trying to catch people out, being in many ways put up and said that you were doing something wrong, you were doing something evil, that's disgusting. And we've encouraged them to actually contact the author of the map and ask for them to be removed, of which those requests have been refused. From Slate, this is Hi-Fi Nation. Philosophy in story form. Recording from Vassar College, here's Barry Lamb. If this conflict seems familiar to Americans, it's because we go through periods like this all of the time with activism. Some group raises an injustice. The public doesn't care or doesn't respond, and so activists get louder and more disruptive with their tactics. Eventually, they too might publish maps, home addresses, and names of people who then feel targeted. This happened with anti-abortion activism in the 90s. It happens with online doxing today, and it's been happening in the environmental movement for some time. Meanwhile, people who aren't activists complain about incivility, or militancy, or extremism. And this cuts across political lines. All you need is an interest group engaging in a moral crusade against something that is perfectly legal, about lives that they believe should be protected. What are the limits to what you can do in the course of that crusade? Because, of course, all the sides think they're on the right side of morality. 
Is there even a way to divorce the morality of the issue with the morality of activist tactics? Well, this week, two philosophers report from Australia as to how the debate is playing out there. Richard Rowland and David Kaloran are philosophers at the Australian Catholic University in Melbourne. Richard is the British voice you've been hearing. David is the American voice. They produced this story. We noticed this wave of activism picking up speed in Melbourne in January 2018, about a year before the Gippy Go action. There was about 30 of us. Um, we walked inside the steakhouse. We addressed the room through a megaphone. We said, we're here to speak up for the animals on these plates as if it was us or our families or friends on these plates. That's Joanne Lee. She's an animal activist who led the steakhouse protest. There's no humane way to kill somebody who doesn't want to die. So we were probably inside for about 20 minutes. Um, the police did take a little while to arrive. It wasn't necessarily about targeting the diners in that restaurant. and It was really about occupying a space where violence is being consumed and being normalised and really just disrupting that space to take it over and say, hey, we're here, we're speaking up for these animals like we would want to be spoken for. The steakhouse protest created a firestorm on social media and in the popular press. Joanne was interviewed on major primetime news shows, and she sees those interviews as successful. We weren't being ridiculed. We weren't these crazy vegans anymore. For the first time, it's been seen as a serious issue, not just some fanatical, crazy, select little group of people doing this. They're annoying people, maybe, and they're interrupting their meals. This is Peter Singer, internationally renowned philosopher and a hugely influential figure in the worldwide animal liberation movement. But, you know, they don't go on about it forever. I mean, it could be taken to limits where people would feel that it was a kind of coercion. Annoying people in steakhouses is only one of the tactics used in the animal rights movement. Aussie Farms is an animal rights charity. Chris Del Force animal activist and filmmaker. Very small group, basically. We started in 2014 when we captured and released footage inside the gas chambers at Australia's largest pig slaughterhouse. And gas chambers are used at most large pig slaughterhouses in Australia. I'd say it accounts for well over 90% of pigs killed. They're sent into a carbon dioxide gas chamber that the industry was calling humane for over 20 years. What we saw in that footage was every pig who goes into that chamber is screaming and thrashing in agony for 30 to 60 seconds. It's the furthest thing imaginable from humane. And we captured the same thing at now five different slaughterhouses. So that was what launched Aussie Farms. And the idea from the start was that we just wanted to force transparency on an industry dependent on secrecy. We want to put everything out there into the open and allow consumers to make up their own minds. If you can get videos of animal suffering in factory farms or part of the live export trade here in Australia, if you can get that onto primetime television, that really does stir people up. Philosopher Claire McCausland. The reason you know about what happens in a factory farm is because someone went in there illegally. The owners of those farms do not want you there. So we rely on people sacrificing their own liberty to tell us what we need to know to make our own decisions. Taking undercover videos of the cruel treatment of animals is generally regarded as a good tactic in the animal liberation movement. Activists use the Aussie Farms map to find places to take videos of the cruel treatment of animals. We asked Chris Del Force, the man behind the map, what he would say to farmers who say that the map makes them afraid. No activist has any interest in the homes of these farmers. But if you're going to basically abuse animals en masse, you can't expect to do that in secrecy anymore. You cannot have these massive sheds full of hundreds of thousands of animals and expect that to be done privately. If you then choose to live on that same property, that's your choice. I don't know the man from a bar or so. David Johinke. But if I was to attack his family for whatever reason of their religion, belief, creed, I would want to know what he would feel about that because that's a personal attack. Unjustified, unauthorised, unbased personal attack. 
my family and my home do not have giant sheds with hundreds of thousands of animals. We're not making money by telling people that we're treating animals humanely while we're treating them awfully and sending them off to be killed. We're not making money through deception. This is not about targeting families. It's about targeting businesses that are misleading consumers. Talking about families and farmers themselves is just a distraction, a deflection from what's happening to animals. Speciesism is a bias or prejudice against taking seriously the interests of beings who are not a member of our species. The term exists to stress the parallel between racism and sexism, which most enlightened people reject. Delforce would acknowledge that there's a cost to farmers, but there's overwhelming suffering of animals on the other side of it. At the same time, many people sympathetic to the plight of animal suffering think that activists need to be less confrontational in their actions. Tyler Paytas is a philosopher at ACU who wrote about the steakhouse protest for the ABC, which is the Australian equivalent of the BBC. He's among those who think the protest was a bad idea. My view is that such actions, there's a good chance that they're going to do more harm than good, and the main reason I hold this view is because ever since I became a vegetarian many years ago, I've noticed this very strong anti-vegan sentiment among people. There is really an urgency to get people to not think of vegans as strange or militant or sort of outside the norm and making it more attractive as something that is not a, a radical departure from normal life. And I, I worry that Occupying the steakhouse and shouting is a demonstration that's going to fuel the, the tendency to think of, of vegans as crazy, unorthodox people who do strange things. There seems to be some basis for Tyler's concern. Direct action in the animal liberation movement in the 80s crossed enough lines that it sent the movement back. I think you do have to be careful with nonviolent activities that they are actually really going to resonate with people in a positive way. The opponents of the animal movement successfully, I would say, branded the movement as, as terrorists. This was before September 11th, 2001. So the, the uh, Secretary for Agriculture, Ronald Reagan, Secretary for Agriculture, said this, that publicly in speeches. I, I felt that the movement was getting somewhat of a bad image rather than a positive image, which is really important for it. It was demoralising for people in the movement to be described that way, people who were totally non-violent. Of course, it was a tiny percentage of the movement who was engaged in this, but nevertheless, it, it seemed to stick. You know, I think the movement really does have to present itself as taking a, an ethical stance. It's very hard to combine taking an ethical stance with being prepared to maim or, or uh, even threaten to kill or people who are involved in exploiting animals. Singer is adamantly anti-violence because he believes that it is counterproductive, not because he's against violence in principle. In general, he sees the justice of activist tactics as wholly dependent on their effectiveness. As a utilitarian, he's not moved at all by the idea that activism has some kind of intrinsic symbolic value. We asked Peter Singer whether groups like those in Melbourne that go into restaurants and chant are bad for the animal rights movement. I honestly don't know whether that's having a positive or a negative effect. I'm sure that some people don't like it, but perhaps it also awakens some people to really thinking about the animals that they're eating. Uh, I'd, I'd like somebody to do some good research on that. J.C. Rees is co-founder of the Sentience Institute and author of the book, The End of Animal Farming. And he studies how effective particular tactics are in animal rights activism. There's a kind of disadvantage that animal rights activists face up front that is unique to their cause. It's something that constrains how effective they can be when they take direct action we can't kind of directly defy the practice that we're opposing. It's not like, you know, people of color coming into a restaurant and sitting at a place where they are not allowed to sit, where you're kind of very directly saying, this is the law or the practice that exists in society, and I am standing up against it because I am one of the oppressed. We can't bring the animals into a place of animal exploitation. Instead, we have to have humans, you know, yelling and disrupting. And this leads to a very different psychology, a very different, you know, perception of it. 
Rees says that because animal rights activists are always in a position of advocating for others rather than for themselves, how people perceive the character and seriousness of the activists plays a big role in how effective that activism is. He argues that animal rights activists should adopt tactics that are perceived to be serious rather than silly. Adopting these tactics connects animal rights activists to the longer tradition of protest movements for human civil rights. So in serious activism, I would put, for example, a, a large march, or I would put someone, you know, chaining themselves to a bullfighting, chaining themselves to the fence so that the uh, event can't go on or something. And these are kind of the tactics that have been used throughout a lot of historical social movements, and they convey a sense of, of seriousness, even though they also cause a lot of opposition because they are disruption. But then we also have confrontational tactics that are less serious, and that are things that don't have as much historical precedent. So this is something like the sex sells activism or something like the cute cartoonish you know animal costumes that you could use or something like throwing fake blood going to, to restaurants or, or other places of animal exploitation and yelling or holding signs and is often seen as more aggressive and more adversarial so when it comes to civil disobedience or at least comes to confrontational activism in general I'd like people to err towards the more serious the less gimmicky the the more in line with historical tactics the things that put the animal stories up front According to JC, unserious gimmicky tactics are examples of merely frivolous activism. That includes stunts by people for the ethical treatment of animals, or PETA. They've run attention-grabbing campaigns, worn funny costumes, and even presented naked women in cages. JC says that this kind of activism doesn't increase sympathy for the plight of animals. It just makes people antagonistic to the people advocating for them. Peter, on the other hand, begged to differ. Those campaigns are the ones that generate the most debate. That's Paula Huff, vice president of Peter Asia Pacific. There is a lot of white noise in the media. It's increasingly hard to be heard on topics that make people uncomfortable. And we have found that our more colorful, racier actions do get the most coverage. That leads to the highest web traffic to our website. The more controversial videos that people come to our website to watch in anger leads to the highest number of views of the undercover investigation video that immediately follows. And they leave having ordered a vegan starter kit. And if we just politely ask people to listen to us just on the facts alone, none of that information would get out there. Well, it seems to me that JC and Tyler are right that confrontational activism is polarizing. Some will think that it's silly or pointless, it will annoy and offend a lot of people. But activists don't need to get everyone or even most people on their side. Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stepan comprehensively looked at activist movements in the 20th century. Every movement that they looked at that gained the sustained participation of 3.5% of the population succeeded. So activists just need to build up the numbers, aiming to get at least 3.5% of the population involved with activism against steakhouses and factory farms. There has been a big turn toward measures of effectiveness all over the activist and philanthropic world in recent years, and there has been concern about whether this kind of turn misses the point of some of the more disruptive forms of protest. While it is good overall that we are focusing on effectiveness in the movement, it can create a bias in favor of the kinds of interventions where the benefits are direct and measurable and against the kinds of interventions where the benefits are indirect and structural. Jeff Sebo is a philosopher and director of the Animal Studies MA at NYU. And I think with moderate conciliatory activism, the benefits are direct and measurable. You can bring people in, have them hear what you have to say, create these incremental reforms. But with confrontation, disruption, people going into restaurants and saying things when people are trying to have dinner, if those have benefits, I think those benefits are going to be in the form of planting a seed of doubt, challenging the status quo, maybe paving the way for moderate reform, which can then pave the way for radical change. And that might be a little bit more indirect and harder to measure. And so if we focus too much on measurable evidence as a proxy for effectiveness, then we might create a movement that overvalues the kinds of moderate conciliatory approaches that bring people in immediately and undervalues the kinds of radical confrontational approaches that might alienate people initially, but then lay the groundwork for making real change in the long run.
So SIBO thinks that focusing on effectiveness might itself be ineffective. But there's another problem with activists restricting themselves to polite tactics. Lauren Gazzola is a prominent activist who is well known for her lengthy imprisonment on animal terrorism charges. The idea that we, for example, do something that makes us look bad, I think is much less of a problem than that we moderate our position because we're afraid we will look bad. Because the question of whether we look good or bad is a function of social norms. And so when we're trying to change those norms, we shouldn't be guided by them. We have to be willing to look bad. And I'm much more concerned about the animal rights movement being too soft on our moral position than I am about us being too hard in our tactical position. When we come back, a discussion of the ethics of civil disobedience, and perhaps even a case for uncivil disobedience. When Hi-Fi Nation returns... This week, philosophers David Killoran and Richard Rowland of the Australian Catholic University examined the activist tactics of the animal liberation movement. David Killoran. Activists see themselves as involved in a principled, morally motivated violation of the law. This is a type of activity known as civil disobedience, or more broadly, principled disobedience of the law. And there's a vast literature about it. It largely follows John Rawls, the eminent, mid-20th century American philosopher known for his groundbreaking book, A Theory of Justice. Civil disobedience for rules has to be open and in public. Privately disobeying a law doesn't count. Also, when you break the law, you need to do it conscientiously. You can't just break the law because you feel like it. You have to think that it's morally the right thing to do. Your breach of the law also has to be non-violent. And finally, you have to be willing to accept jail time or a fine for your actions. A third piece of Rawls's picture that's interesting is the general fidelity to the legal system. So in his mind, civilly disobedient actors are not revolutionaries. Uh, they are broadly faithful to the system. That's Kimberly Brownlee, a philosopher at the University of Warwick and an expert on the morality of protest and civil disobedience. Her view is that Rawls thinks of civil disobedience as a way of working within a system to fight a part of it that you believe to be unjust. Civil disobedience on this view requires you to embrace certain parts of the system in order to highlight the injustice of other parts of it. So in many ways, civil disobedience is a relatively conservative act. This explains some of the conditions that justify civil disobedience on the classic Rawlsian view. A just cause. The cause that you're fighting for has to be, in fact, right. It's not enough that you sincerely believe that it is right. There are these objective conditions for justice that have to be met. Uh, second condition is that you're resorting to this when you've tried everything else. So this is a last resort. Because you're trying to embrace as much of the system as you can, breaking the law can't be your first option, it can only be your last one. Rawls's third condition is some attempt to coordinate with other dissenting groups, other minority groups. This condition is there to make sure that your cause isn't too much of a burden on the public. Make sure everyone is together, unified, to bring a list of grievances all at once, rather than having disparate groups trying to monopolize the public's time about an issue. Likelihood of success. So if your efforts are going to be futile, well, then you actually shouldn't resort to breach of law. You know, engaging in a legal protest, even if it's fairly constrained, brings risks. There's the risk of violence. There's the risk of inspiring other people who are less civil, less constrained. There's the fact that you change the conversation with the law. When you break the law in protest, you essentially require law enforcement to pay attention to you in a different way. You'd better be fairly confident you're going to do some good with this, otherwise you shouldn't be resorting to breach of law. This is why many animal rights activists are preoccupied with effectiveness. 
They're not interested in pointless, ineffective and risky activism. They want their activism to make a difference and to bring about the end of factory farming, not to harm people for no tangible benefit. The idea that it's okay to take action that does more harm than good violates everything that utilitarian animal activists like Singer and Sibo stand for. But these moral conditions on civil disobedience aren't the only game in town, and they really are contrary to the approach to activism of activists like Joanne Lee. Candace Delmas, a philosopher at Northeastern University in Boston, says there's also such a thing as uncivil disobedience, and sometimes uncivil disobedience is what's called for. And civil disobedience is not necessarily communicative. They may be covert, where the agent hides their identity, evasive, they seek to evade punishment or uh, arrest, anonymous, violent, uh, involving some property damage or coercion or injury to others, or deliberately offensive, so uh, in violation of decorum or social norms of civility. And examples include um, black bloc tactics, riots, sabotage, leaks of classified information, distributed denial of service attacks, guerrilla theater, roadblocks, street art, vigilantism, and also much of what animal liberation and environmental activists engage in, such as uh, monkey wrenching and tree spiking, anti-whaling piracy operation, heckling and storming of, you know, restaurant or splashing of paint on fur and, of course, covert and open rescue operations. Even some people who think that civil disobedience is a good idea will say that uncivil disobedience is beyond the pale. But Delmas believes that uncivil disobedience can play a variety of important social roles. When some citizens are effectively denied full and equal status in a society that otherwise is committed to respecting everyone's full and equal status, and when the injustice of this denial is not publicly recognized, then you may have the, the conditions in place for uncivil disobedience to force the community to confront the disconnect between its reality and its professed ideals. Incivility can call civility's bluff uh, by questioning the rules of public engagement and their exclusionary effects, who gets to speak, where, when and how, by highlighting the deceptions of civic friendship. And so I think that even when there is no hope of moral suasion and even no chance of inducing shame, in fact, uncivil disobedience may still have intrinsic value just as, as a fitting response to injustice, an expression of warranted frustration and distrust at society given its failure to treat some members as fully equals. Um, it can be a worthwhile exercise of individual and collective agency. It can be an expression of dignity. It can be an expression of solidarity. And again, it can do all these things, even if it fails to contribute to a long-term goal of reform. Maybe it's just right to stand up against and reveal injustices. We don't need there to be good consequences of an action to do this. Sometimes this is called a purely expressive reason for engaging in a type of activism. But it's controversial whether these kinds of reasons can ever fully justify a highly disruptive process, even for a just cause. Peter Singer. There's, there's certainly an idea that you know if there's an injustice, you ought to stand up against it, whether it makes any difference or not. And you know we can admire people who do that, but. Ultimately, again, if you feed me a hypothetical example and you say, well, it's, you know, here, here's somebody who will protest, they will be harmed, they will be worse off, and there's zero po probability that any good will come out, out of it, then I would say, don't do it. David, what do you think Delmas means by calling civilities bluff? I think she means that niceness and decorum in civil disobedience can create an illusion that even if the status quo isn't acceptable, it might be within the ballpark of acceptability. Incivility can disrupt that illusion and make it possible for us to attend to injustices that we otherwise would not be in a position to see or would not fully and vividly see. I think that illusion is the bluff that incivility calls on her view. That makes me think of Sea Shepherd. So Sea Shepherd patrol the seas 
on the lookout for whaling vessels. They're not even pretending to be like a like civilly disobedient. They're clearly uncivil. We talked to Claire McCausland, who's an Australian philosopher who studies animal activism and, and, and also Sea Shepherd in particular. As they engaged in propeller fouling, they threw acid onto the ships of Japanese whalers, ostensibly with a view, and I believe with a view to spoiling the whale meat so that it wasn't suitable for consumption. Um, but this is still pretty reckless behaviour, and I think it's very difficult to describe that as civil activity in that understanding of civil as non violent. Uh, When we asked Sea Shepherd activists, did you see violence at sea, however, their response was, oh, yes, we saw heaps of it on the part of the Japanese whalers, right? So they feel that they're engaged in a battle. When we think about the sorts of actions that Sea Shepherd is engaged in, we might suppose that the whole point is just to stop whalers from whaling. And that does seem to be at least part of the point. But another function of their actions might be more subtle. In engaging in uncivil acts, Sea Shepherd might be said to call civility's bluff in Delmas's terms, and perhaps that will function to open the eyes of the public, even if it is not immediately effective in stopping whalers. Many people will agree that principled disobedience is at least in some cases justifiable, something that it's morally okay for you to engage in. But Delmas takes the radical view that uncivil disobedience is more than morally permissible, it's sometimes obligatory. If you're not engaged in it for at least some causes, then you're doing something wrong. I uh, try to show that benefiting from an exploitative or harmful scheme of coordination, so a social scheme, uh, you know, some arrangements under certain uh, conditions, involves the same kinds of wrong as free writing does. So if you benefit from an unjust scheme, you're doing something similar than you are when you free ride, which is that you're objectionably arrogating privileges to yourself or you're just wrongfully exploiting others. Fairness prohibits benefiting from exploitative or harmful schemes. So you have then have a duty to cease cooperating with that system from which you benefit. And the way to cease benefiting from an unjust scheme of coordination is to try to change it so that it no longer exploits and harms other people. And in this case, you can just free ride on others' resistance efforts. So there's also this fair play argument for joining others in an anti-oppression struggle. The unjust treatment of animals actually seems like a clear case of exploitation and of uh, generation of problematic benefits. So it sounds like a fertile ground to think that we have obligations to resist at least some forms of animal exploitation. So Richard, I think we should zoom in on one of Candace Delmas's really important ideas. According to Delmas, if I am the beneficiary of a given form of injustice, then that gives me a special new kind of reason to resist or fight against that injustice. Uh, what do you think about that idea? So I'm not a utilitarian like Peter Singer and Jeff Sebo, but I do share kind of one thought with them. You know, utilitarians think you shouldn't cry over spilt milk. You shouldn't think about features of the past as giving rise to obligations for you to do things. All that matters is the kind of future consequences. And you should like look forward rather than backwards. It's about the benefits you can bring about by your actions, not anything in the past that matters. And so I, I kind of agree with them and not with Dalmas that if we do have obligations to be activists, it can't be because of, the, of our benefiting from uh, injustices in the past. It must be because we can bring about the end of injustices in the future. Another issue with Candace Dalmas's view is that it seems to get the importance of benefit backwards. So in general, if something is beneficial to us, that seems to usually give us some kind of reason in favor of it. But according to Delmas's view, uh, if an injustice is beneficial to me, then that gives me a reason to fight against it. So if there is an injustice that is harmful to us, then we actually have one less reason to fight against that injustice than we would have in the case where the injustice is beneficial to us. 
Yeah, and I don't think that this is that's just a kind of theoretical idea too. I think it's pretty intuitive to think that that most of the time, if something benefits us, that's a kind of count in favour of it. So take take the animals case. So I, I think that a lot of people who aren't vegetarian or vegan share the view that if some meat is going to waste and you can eat it that it's certainly morally fine to do that and they'll, they'll kind of use that intuition to argue against vegetarians or vegans so they'll be like if there's there's some meat lying around it's already been dead well, and you can uh, use the meat from that animal to benefit you or someone else that it seems morally fine to do it um, so you might be benefiting from something harmful that's happened in the past but that benefit doesn't seem to make the harmful thing that happened in the past worse in fact it seems to kind of be be good that you benefit from something that happened just to illustrate the point, it might be useful to have an example. Imagine two business executives, Pete and Samantha. Samantha has profited from some unjust labor laws, whereas Pete has not profited from those unjust labor laws. Um, but both Pete and Samantha are equally well positioned to do something to correct the injustice of those labor laws. Then I take it on Candace Delmas's view, Samantha has a special kind of reason that Pete doesn't have to do something about the injustice of those labor laws. Whereas I take it on your view, given that both of these individuals are equally capable of doing something about the injustice, they have the same reasons and have the same obligations with regard to that injustice. Uh, is that about right? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think we probably are morally obliged, like Candace Delmas thinks, to get involved in certain kind of activism. But that's because uh, we can, as a member of an activist group, achieve change, achieve pretty significant change in the future together. Well, it seems to me that we probably aren't obligated to be involved in the kind of activism that people like Crystal Force and Joanne Lee are involved in. The kind of activism that they do is really burdensome. They uh, incur really serious personal costs, you know, in terms of like harassment from people on the other side of the issue or just in terms of the amount of time and in some cases legal fees that they have to that they have to pay. There's an obligation to do that kind of thing. That's a very demanding obligation, and it's not really clear to me that morality is quite that demanding. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Chris. Yeah. So Crystal Force is getting getting harassed a lot of the time, and the activism is like the entirety of Joanne Lee's life. Uh, yeah, you, you're right. I mean, we're not we're not necessarily obligated to uh, get involved in activism in that way. I think we have quite a lot of latitude uh, in the way in which we do get involved in activist movements, but that we have maybe an obligation to do some kind of activism. We have not. We have latitude over the means that we take in activism. Some people might want to get involved in activism in the way that John Lee does or in, well, in the way that Peter does by you know getting engaged in uh, uh, attention grabbing uh, newsworthy activism or you might be able to get involved in activism by going to protests and handing out leaflets in ways that like Tyler Paytas would like um, but we have an obligation to do something we just have latitude over the means that we uh, we take up uh, there's a further question we could ask about the causes that we get involved in. Um, we could ask, is there an obligation to be an animal activist in particular? Or is it okay for us to focus on other kinds of causes? Do we have to do something about each and every important cause? Or can we just sort of pick the ones that we want? Yeah, this is a kind of quite complicated question. So so some people, uh, like effective altruists like Singer, will think that you should get involved in the cause that you're able to achieve the most good by getting involved in. So I'm, I'm, I'm not really attracted to that. So I think that you have last two with regards to causes as well as regards to means. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, serious injustices that are happening. Anthropogenic climate change and our government's not stopping that. The awful things happening to animals, the awful things happening to refugees, the awful things happening in the third world. You have, might have the latitude in which of these different injustices you get involved in a movement to, um, to bring about change regarding. Uh, this reminds me of a conversation that we recently had with the well-known Marxist philosopher Brian Leiter, who also is in general concerned about injustice, but Leiter happens to be very skeptical of the animal rights movement. There are tens of thousands of people living in miserable circumstances, 
And in that context, it always has just struck me as a little perverse and kind of a little depraved almost to be spending your time talking about chickens and pigs and cows. I do think that many of those, you know, involved in things like, you know, animals' rights and animal ethics probably consider themselves somewhat on the left. They probably should reflect a little harder than I think they typically do about the genuine structural causes of harms to well-being of both human and non-human animals. Local forms of a activism are not going to topple, you know, the fundamental economic relations in our society and now in most of the world. When people tell me that what we need to do is to overthrow capitalism rather than provide bed nets for kids who are going to die from malaria or, for that matter, reduce the suffering of animals in factory farms, there's two questions that I want to ask them. Um, one is, so what exactly are you going to replace capitalism with? Because I'm not aware of any alternative economic system that has actually been tried out on even a fairly modest scale and has shown to be successful in producing the kind of goods that people want and are using. And, and secondly, even if you did show me that there was a, a better example that we could have a reasonable amount of confidence would, would work better than capitalism, how are we going to get from here to there? Nobody's given me a halfway plausible answer to the question as to how capitalism is to be overthrown. So if the suggestion is that, well, for the next 50 or 100 or 1,000 years that it's going to take to get rid of capitalism, those babies are just going to have to go on dying from malaria, those chickens are going to have to go on suffering in factory farms, that seems to me the wrong answer. The other thing that I would add specifically with regard to the animal movement is that when we had alternatives to capitalism on a large scale, namely under Soviet communism, they set up huge factory farms too. And uh, it's not as if the animals under Soviet communism really suddenly had all their interests taken into consideration. Not at all. They were just as much things and means to the ends of people as they are under capitalism. So I think actually speciesism is more fundamental than capitalism. What do you think, David? Do you think that animal laxism is just one of many or that there's no, you know, do you think that it's pointless, like lighter, or do you think it's like the, the most important cause that we can devote our activist energies to? My view is that animal rights is a pretty good candidate for being the most important cause available to us in the present moment. Um, and that's partly because of the scale of the problem that the animal rights movement is trying to solve. Uh, there are many tens of billions of animals being kept in miserable conditions and violently killed each year. The number of individuals is many times larger than the human population. So the amount of harm that the animal rights movement is trying to prevent is really unimaginably huge. And further, I think that animal rights is one area where we really have a chance of making a difference. We currently have the technology and the ability to feed and clothe ourselves adequately and to have healthy and happy lives while at the same time dramatically reducing our collective dependence on animal exploitation. And if we were to do this, we would spare trillions of individuals. Richard Rowland and David Kiloran are philosophers at the Dianoia Institute of Philosophy at the Australian Catholic University in Melbourne. They produced that piece for us. Since the events reported in this episode, vegan protests have continued to spread across Australia, and they're becoming more disruptive, particularly in Melbourne. In one recent protest, 39 people were arrested and charged with blocking the busiest intersections, train, and tram lines. After the first Gippy Goat action on Boxing Day, the goat that was abducted, Angel, was returned to the farm, only to be abducted again a month later. Then finally, on April 6th of this year, 2019, Gippy Goat closed its cafe and closed the farm and petting zoo to the public. The Attorney General of Western Australia, John Quigley, recently proposed allowing five-year restraining orders against, quote, mushy-headed vegans to prevent them from returning to farms. 
If you want to hear more, this week we have a bonus episode exclusively for Slate Plus members. Since you didn't hear much from me this week, I decided to have a panel discussion with Slate's very own Stephen Metcalf from the Slate Culture Gab Fest. We sit down and talk about what we think of the issues raised in this episode. Here's a sneak preview. Absent something like a Rawlsian or liberal framework within which to settle these disputes, how do you have any principled way of distinguishing between a moral hero and a terrorist, for example? To ground the argument a little bit, I want to just before we finish, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about I know you're an empiricist, right? Generally, uh, yeah. Or, yeah. Or you yeah. like... Have an orientation, to, yeah. Y- yeah, you have no, as a humanities professor, you have no uh, aversion to, to turning to empirical data. Yeah. Um, 3.5 percent has a very special place in this episode right. that I thought was that I thought was fascinating. Maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So according to this data, if 3.5 percent of the population happens to identify enough with your cause to engage in some form of activism, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be uncivil disobedience, right? It doesn't even have to be civil disobedience. It's just enough. Then the society will change in the direction of that cause. I mean, that's just an astonishing number. And, you know, so now you have to imagine, let's say your cause is, a, you know, assuming assuming for the purposes of this argument, you could know this, your cause is at 3.3%, right? You're just yeah. beneath the threshold where change might happen. You can very often do something that's just grotesque, right? It's kind of a grotesque form of public theater. It's, it's intended to be completely outrageous. It does, in fact, outrage people, and it drives an enormous amount of traffic to a video. Some percentage of the people going to that video, maybe an overwhelming percentage of the people going to the video are going there to be disgusted at your at your public display and your public incivility. But some small percentage um, actually suddenly is clicking on other links on your website and is suddenly uh, educating themselves to the cause. And maybe you're at 3.3%. And you do something appalling to the sensibility of the general public, and you drive an immense amount of traffic to your website, that's going to bump you over three and a half percent, and an actual social change is going to happen. I mean, what turns on whether or not that gets you from 3.3 to 3.6 or from 3.3 to 3.1? I mean, let's say it drives you down to 2.8 percent. How much do we allow the our sense of intrinsic justness? to wobble in the face of numbers like that because in some sense we don't want to live in a in a moral majoritarian universe there has to be some notion of the intrinsic justness of causes you can get this and all other slate bonus content including ad-free episodes of every slate podcast by signing up for slate plus just go to slate.com slash hi-fi plus or click the link in the show notes. Hi-Fi Nation is produced and edited by Barry Lamb, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Vassar College. For Slate Podcasts, Editorial Director is Gabriel Roth. Senior Managing Producer is June Thomas. Senior Producer is TJ Raphael. Production assistance this season provided by Jake Johnson and Noah mendoza Goot. Visit hifination.org for complete show notes, soundtrack, and reading list for every episode. <laughs>